That delusional neckbeard actually thought he gave off Jason Momoa vibes. <laughs> How much does someone have to gas you up for you to be like, yeah, I, I look just like Jason Momoa. <laughs> and that feels pretty darn good. Oh. Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily cringe content anywhere on the internet. Promise swearsies, it's just a fact and it's totally science. Go ahead, look it up if you want. Um, <laughs> today we've got a little bit more Funky P, uh, some backstory on how all of this got started. So we've seen the end of the story and now we get to Tarantino back to the beginning and I'm here for it, you're here for it, why not? Let's go ahead and see how it goes. Shadowrun Mayhem Lore Goes Balls Deep. Funky P Backstory. <laughs> and welcome back, of course, to user Cringy Val. Uh, following the events of Funky P Beard and Shadowrun Mayhem, Sage stood nervously in the doorway as a Molly Maid vehicle pulled into his driveway. Molly slammed the door, straightened her apron, and marched right up the steps. Molly, Mr. Mage, we meet again. I was devastated to get your call, Sage. Yeah, I really hated to trouble you, cause it's not pretty, Molly. Is there a bunch of effluvia all over your nasty, nasty house again? More doo-doo? Another vomitorium in the living room. Will I need to call in reinforcements, Sage? Probably. I mean, there's puke in the office and in the living room. Some idiot shot an infected load all over the one of the bedrooms, but I, I think that got cleaned up. And oh, there's also this super sticky snail trail. <laughs> uh, did you hear that, kids? The word of the day is snail trail. Ah! You said the secret word. Molly says, a snail trail. Are you running an illegal snail mucin factory along with your rot gut distillery? Athena came back downstairs and greeted Molly apologetically. Did you hear about Val's snail trail? It starts on the back porch where she and Axton were getting frisky. My pussy left a snail trail across the dance floor. I gotta be honest, that, that's an impressive snail trail. <laughs> Uh, you drink a lot of water or something? Never mind. <laughs> Molly. So when he said snail trail, he meant... Uh, uh, she gagged. That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard in my life. You should be ashamed of yourselves for that sort of talk. <laughs> uh, oh, I am. Deeply. <laughs> Sage's cell phone rang, and it was Axton. Axton. How's the cleanup going? Sage. Not great. We're having to deal with Val's giant snail trail. That's kind of your fault, bro. <laughs> uh, Axton laughed. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad she can secrete a snail trail. She'll need it because my dong is dinosauric. Oh my God, it's mammoth in size. <laughs> uh, this is like getting wildly out of hand all of a sudden. I think I've been rused. Is this a true story? It can't be. Who's slip slippery sliming all over the floors like this? <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, meanwhile, Molly turned to Athena and asked with some degree of genuine concern, What is wrong with you people? How did it get this bad? <laughs> Nobody knows. What I do know is that the word of the day was definitely snail trail. <laughs> Uh, origins of Shadowrun Mayhem. No, not Mayhem. Uh, degeneracy. Oh, now we're getting into some real stuff. Okay. Snail Trails was just for the lols. Welcome to this little exploration of the lore behind the nasty, nasty gaming weekends. Gotta be some deep lore there, bro. <laughs> This was fun to write, but please keep in mind that this is just a fictionalized version of several slightly conflicting tales that I've stitched together. Does it manage to explain the degeneracy? I don't really think explain is the right word. <laughs> the only real explanation for our tolerance of the degeneracy is that most of us had previous experiences that made Mori's absurd rules and kinky shenanigans seem not terribly degenerate in comparison. That's a sad story though. 
We're all just a bunch of broken people walking around, eh? We... Not that any time in history was really ideal, I think, but now it's completely rampant. And <laughs> the truth is we're here to suffer trials and tribulations. And if humor is the way that you deal with it, well, I understand 100%. <laughs> uh, I like to think that I would get up and out, but had I lived even a slightly different life, who's to say that I would? Anyway, if your experiences have been a different flavor of bizarre, you're never going to walk away saying, Oh, I, I see. It all makes sense now. So basically, I'm just kind of here to gross you out some more. <laughs> yeah, we'll take that too. You're saying basically the same thing that I'm saying. Like, I can't really understand, but I can try and be understanding, I guess, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'll take a stab at explaining my own personal apathy towards the staff, so please allow me to give you a bit of my own backstory. Oh, we're really going for the deep dive. I was still a virgin when I was a sophomore in college, and that was when I met my first super serious boyfriend, for reals. <laughs> I was in no hurry to lose my V-card, so college boyfriends, aka Fartnock and Jar Jar Binks, decided to drag me along to group activities, BDSM extravaganzas, illegal gentlemen's clubs, and Tijuana. Use your imagination. <laughs> the donkey shows are real. You gotta go, at least once. Just for the experience. Just don't pay for the popcorn, it's super overpriced. <laughs> they probably don't have popcorn. Probably have to bring my own popcorn. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, fart knocking Jar Jar Binks. Definitely not respecting OP's decisions. How <laughs> Uh, he thought that exposing me to extreme deviant acts would get me all horned up and make me extra eager to hop in the sack. <laughs> He's an idiot. He's an amateur. No idea how to cultivate a proper snail trail. <laughs> Again, I say... How <laughs> uh, God, I hate Jar Jar Binks, man. What a fucking terrible character. That's how you knew Lucas really lost it. <laughs> Honestly, it was, it was probably Elliot Rogers' mom that convinced him to put it in there. <laughs> he was the inspiration for all of that. Oh, the lore grows deep. If you haven't seen his manifesto on the channel, please do go check that out. I'm pushing it really hard because we're going to get into some more weirdos similar to him. So yes, of course, all of these explicit acts had the opposite effect. So Maury's flaccid, solitary, human, dingling, <laughs> even when it was pressed against my forehead, was not so terribly shocking. It's all a matter of perspective, I suppose. <laughs> First person perspective. <laughs> Because I'll be honest, like, watching a, a third-person donkey doing his thing is a lot different than, like, human schmeat on the forehead, right? Maybe not. Go to war in the comments. <laughs> As for why the other team members let these monkey shines slide, well, it's not really my place to spill the details of the debauched detritus that they had witnessed before they were mentally and emotionally prepared. Ah, oh, come on, man. We all had some stuff happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> Broad strokes, though, I'll say that Athena had dated an older weirdo who behaved a lot like fart-knocking Jar Jar. Sage had been a hellion in high school and had spent some time in juvie where he had participated in some, uh, outlandish pranks. <laughs> also involving Schmeet. But he was in a male facility, so no snail trail there, luckily. <laughs> Uh, Axton had witnessed behavior far more disgusting than Maury's at church camp. Ugh. And Snorlax was just chronically unfazed by any and all stupidity. Or absurdity. Or both. <laughs> uh, chronic probably being the operative word. If you puff so that, you won't care about shit no more. <laughs> Does any of that really explain anything? No? Well, I didn't think it would. <laughs> <laughs> You're so helpful, OP. But I'll tease a truth bomb that many of you have probably already guessed. Most, if not all, of the pervy nonsense sprang from the homoerotic subtext of Maury's friendship with Funky, and everyone knew it. Fascinating. Terrifying. 
How bad do these people want to play Shadowrun? <laughs> When I asked the OGs for stories about the formative years of Shadowrun Mayhem, they didn't have much to say about Mori, other than to compliment his leadership qualities and to remark that he had exactly zero shame. When it came to Funky, they had nothing but nasty things to say about him. Perhaps I'll accidentally touch on topics that elucidate Funky's anger and insecurity? Hmm. For whatever it's worth, here's what I was able to piece together. I mean, I have my own theories about Funky's anger and insecurity. I think one of his parents played some wiggle worm in the bathtub when he was little. <laughs> and you know, that, that ain't never no good. Then people ask me to, to expound upon it. Hey, Reddix, what's wiggle worm? I, I'd rather not explain it. <laughs> Use your imagination. <laughs> uh, part one. So damned unpretty. What a terrible thing to say or think. <laughs> Long before the events of the nasty, nasty story, Mori befriended Funky at a dingy beer joint in a small college town in Southern California. Funky had already dropped his classes, but had decided to continue living on campus until his government funding ran out. Mr. Fucking do nothing over here, right? <laughs> Mori, who was pre-law at the time, instantly recognized that Funky was a man-child <laughs> and took on a big brother role to this lanky, awkward moron with his scraggly beard. Mori truly believed that he could help Funky grow into a respectable human being, and that tickled Mori's leadership goals and, well, mild god complex. <laughs> Is it mild? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> You sure about that? You sure about that? Funky was enthralled by this confident, unapologetically lascivious new friend and vowed that he would emulate every aspect of Mori's behavior. Probably not a road you want to go down. <laughs> There's certain things we could pick and choose. We don't have to do the whole thing, right? <laughs> Uh, all of that was until he found out that Mori was bisexual. Funky was shocked, revolted, and furious, especially with himself, for having misjudged Mori's predilections. Now, Funky loved lesbians. Some of his closest friends from his flag-twirling band geek days were lesbians. <laughs> Wow, those kids suck. <laughs> Where's your passion for the music? Everybody pack it in. Go home. <laughs> so yes, Funky loved the ladies that loved the ladies, but he didn't trust anyone who liked Dong, and that very much includes heterosexual women. So his already flimsy sense of self was utterly shattered by the realization that he had briefly idolized a literal Peter Puffer. <laughs> I mean, does that change things all that much for you? I guess it does. But really, the signs were all right there. He's got a pink beard with beads in it. <laughs> You're like, that guy seems cool. <laughs> uh, I realize he probably didn't have a pink beard in college, but it's funnier to picture it that way. <laughs> Uh, Mori managed to get back into his little brother's good graces by explaining that enjoying success in the dating world hinged on being able to look at both sexes as people, and not getting overly attached to the desired outcome before you even know the person. Good advice, not even slightly degenerate, high five. <laughs> to Funky's surprise, he started getting dates with women when he took Mori's approach, and Mori was once again his hero. So essentially what happened here is Mori created a monster, because he, he would have just lived by himself and spiraled downward all alone, probably not even harming anyone. <laughs> but instead Mori uh, fixed him up enough to let him out into the dating world, only for these poor innocent women to realize that the repair was shoddy, the engine is cracked, it might explode at any moment! <laughs> <laughs> it will. Uh, so the two of them became the best of friends. Funky had no money, no work ethic, and no real passion for anything except for arguing. Aside from his fondness for fussing about these fatuous fights long after his opponent had grown weary of Funky's fistful of fallacies and frequent flaunting of the Dunning-Kruger effect, 
It's really nice alliteration. You're perfect. <laughs> uh, Maury encouraged him to study law and to revisit his philosophy studies, but Funky loathed college. He's another philosophy major, just like we had uh, Schopenbeard in the last episode, that philosophy student who idolized Schopenhauer called all women cattle. You might think that I read this episode just to get that plug in there, but I didn't even know that that was in here. Sometimes the stars just align. Anyway, Funky loathed college and decided to become a self-taught professional intellectual by joining a bunch of online forums. <laughs> uh, oh my God. He consulted Professor Google on the reg and posted under-researched, poorly structured, and rudely worded rants about anything that pissed him off. And just about everything did manage to piss him off. He's in a really dark place and he can't see it. <laughs> and I don't think Maury can either. Or Maury thinks, yeah, I can pull him up and out, but like, you're not a psychological professional of any sort, right? <laughs> you're, you're majoring in, in lawyer stuff. Maybe don't make him your little pet project. Maybe advocate for him to get some real help. But no, I can fix them. I can totally fix them. <laughs> Maury continued with his studies, eventually graduating with a double major in poli-sci and philosophy. He got into law school, but decided to take a year off and travel the world before knuckling down and committing to his studies. And Funky, who had been freeloading off of Maury ever since they'd met, was just sort of along for the ride. <laughs> Must be nice. Maury came from a wealthy family, you see. So Funky rode Maury's family's coattails into the high life during Maury's gap year. A gap year that tripled in length <laughs> until Maury finally decided to just forego law school, take a few night classes, and settle into a cushy career as a paralegal. Yeah, it pays pretty good money. Should have gone the full nine, but what can you do? <laughs> the fire was extinguished. Where motivation fails, discipline must set in, and yeah, neither Funky nor Maury seemed the type to have much discipline, so... <laughs> Uh, uh, before Maury settled into his career, life was all international vacations and fancy dinners at restaurants that served char-grilled endangered species, manly spa days with a happy ending, <laughs> renting a party house in the Hollywood Hills for a summer, and finally, modeling classes. Yes, but why male models? <laughs> One of the high-class escorts that Maury had paid to hook up with Funky at the summer house had told him that he should be a model because he's so tall. Flattered by the pro's words that Maury probably paid her to say, Funky ran to his big bro and begged him to beg his daddy to pay for modeling classes. <laughs> Uh, oh, this is, this is pathetic, dude. <laughs> Maury had his own Amex black card, and Daddy didn't really monitor his financial irresponsibility whatsoever. So we could pretty clearly see why Maury really has no self-discipline. For Funky, I think it's a much different story, but I can't quite suss out what that is yet. By all accounts, he should be motivated to pull himself up towards something greater, but he doesn't. He just lies there. <laughs> so Maury agreed to take the classes with Funky for the first few weeks since Funky was nervous as shit. As it turned out, Funky couldn't take direction, had zero charisma, refused to unfurrow his brow, and was often too tipsy to even traverse the catwalk. Disaster. <laughs> Maury, on the other hand, had charisma for days, was usually coked out, perfectly acceptable if not encouraged in the modeling industry, <laughs> and he could charm the pants off both male and female designers. Damn, Funky got cucked for the modeling thing. <laughs> and all this was long before Maury had the pink hair and the glitzy beard. He just knew how to talk to strangers, and was completely comfortable in front of the camera in any attire, from any angle, in any situation. So Maury started booking gigs, while Funky only got to be a bum in the background for a single ad campaign that never even ran. <laughs> a bum, bro. They looked at his beard, they're like, yeah, close enough. <laughs> uh. 
Funnily enough, I also uh, was in a single ad campaign <laughs> when I was working the Renaissance Fair. They came around, I guess because we were already costumes, and they cast a bunch of us as extras in a Summer's Eve douche commercial. <laughs> So if you see a Summer's Eve commercial that has like knights on horses riding towards each other at some point, yeah. I was somewhere back in the stands. I don't know if the commercial ran, but yeah, that was my shot at stardom, I guess. <laughs> I don't know which one's worse. Like, yeah, mine was a douche commercial, but you were a literal bum. I was just a peasant. <laughs> anyway, uh, flash forward to the events following the Shadowrun Mayhem game. Oh yeah, this Tarantino went really hard, isn't it? <laughs> After Mori and Funky took themselves out of the game, Sage mentioned Mori's stories of adventures in male modeling during a chill, enjoyable, non-degenerate game night. We all found it hilarious, and I vaguely recalled an instance when Funky bemoaned his failed modeling career in the midst of a drunken meltdown. <laughs> I thought he'd just been making up some malarkey to use as yet another excuse for being a complete bell end. That delusional neckbeard actually thought he gave off Jason Momoa vibes. <laughs> Until cold, hard reality smacked him in the face with the flaccid dong that Funky had failed to cheer up. How much does someone have to gas you up for you to be like, yeah, I, I look just like Jason Bomboa. <laughs> and that feels pretty darn good. Oh. Uh, are you sure, bro? The eyes, the hair, the muscle, it's, it's all sort of really different. <laughs> Uh, I haven't really kept in touch with Maury, so I'd feel weird reaching out to him and asking for details about the modeling classes, but holy shit, if I ever run into Maury again and it seems safe to sit down for a long conversation with him, I feel like Funky P Goes to Modeling School could be a potentially amusing one-off. Maybe. I mean, I'd read it, but I'm not gonna hold my breath for all that to happen. <laughs> I sort of feel like this whole modeling school vignette is giving off super gay slash fiction vibes. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just not sure that I'm the right person to be writing such smut. I mean, you could do it. Get as explicit as you want. We'll just have to fade to black and put it up for patrons and YouTube members only. Hey, have you signed up on my Patreon yet? I'd really appreciate it if you would. One of your dollars is like multiples of my pesos, so help a brother out. How about... And now we're back into the earlier years of Mori and Funky's bromance. Once the days of male modeling were in the past, the bros returned to the upscale townhouse that they shared, and Mori's mommy paid for it. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. <laughs> Mori is Engels and Clearly funky as Marx. <laughs> I bet he would even support some of the same views. He doesn't want to work. He wants to be in the upper crust. Make a living off of the sweat of everyone else's brow. I know the type. It's just a good thing that these two have absolutely no drive or ambition. <laughs> Life just beat that out of them or never instilled it in the first place because they were born with the silver spoon stuffed firmly in between his buttocks. <laughs> Funky was silent and sulky because Mori had gotten a bit of work and made some extra cash that, well, he didn't even need, and he managed to have a blast doing it. Isn't it interesting how far having a good attitude about things will take you? <laughs> I find it really fascinating, and some people still choose to be miserable. I don't get it, man. Uh, embittered by Mori's seemingly effortless success, Funky soaked himself into a stupor until he couldn't even get out of bed. The air in his room was thick with the brackish, chlorinated notes of vile copium. <laughs> and a ruinous combination of inflated ego and small peepee energy. Well, you be careful with that. That combination's what tipped the scales for old Elliot. Mori finally barged into the beard nest and threatened to have Funky committed if he didn't snap out of it. <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to do nothing in my house. I mean, you are, but only the nothing that I approve of. <laughs> Gradually, Funky did begin participating in the world again, but as always, it was to a limited extent. 
The modeling class had confirmed Funky's deepest fears that he wasn't pretty. Self-fulfilling prophecy. So Funky doubled down on his efforts to dress well. He learned how to style his own hair, at least the hair on his head, not his beard, never his beard. He began wearing woman's perfume, and he explored possible career paths, for which his physical attractiveness wasn't a prerequisite. Yeah, which is basically anything except the thing that you chose. <laughs> you could still be in, like, films and stuff if you look weird. Now you're just a character actor! <laughs> According to Funky, he got fired from the OG McKamey Manor for breaking character, cursing, and hanging dong in front of a few female patrons. You what?! <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is McKamey Manor? One of the most extreme haunted house experiences in the US. According to Google, was he really that desperate to scare them? <laughs> Clearly it worked. <clears throat> the manor was a volunteer position, so getting the boot didn't hurt Funky financially. What do you mean a volunteer position? <laughs> uh, he really is just determined to not do anything. Okay, fine, I'll do that thing scaring those girls, as long as they don't pay me money for it. And I get to pull my dong out. Should have read the fine print, son. <laughs> uh, could any of this possibly be true? Well, Funky and Maury were living just outside of San Diego, not far from the controversial haunt's original location. Being tall, skinny, and angry looking, he would have certainly been fitting for a haunted house actor, so I could see where any spooky themed venue probably would have given Funky a chance. If McKamey Manor weren't infamous nowadays, I wouldn't doubt Funky's story. But seeing as McKamey Manor still comes and goes as a somewhat hot topic, it seems like Funky might have just been name dropping. That is the saddest possible thing to lie about. You lied about a volunteer position <laughs> getting fired from a volunteer position. I don't know man, if I were to lie, <laughs> it would not be about that. So, after getting booted out of his haunted house gig, regardless of whether the boot that kicked his flat ass belonged to Russ McKamey, Funky did spiral into another debilitating depression and told Maury that he was running away to find himself. Where did he go? Well, in one version he joined Greenpeace, in another version he joined the Peace Corps. I think there's a version where he also became a monk. <laughs> there's also a version where his mother was briefly released from prison and Funky acted as the bouncer for the brothel that she ran. <laughs> uh, oh my god. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> the most likely story is that he spent about six months or so living in the encampment underneath the Dodge Street Bridge in Wellsprings. Well, if I found God anywhere, it would be by the tracks. Face down in a boxcar, 40 in both hands. No, but seriously, I don't think Funky found anything down there. Nothing good, anyways. <laughs> uh, when he returned from his adventures, he was even more despondent. What happened to you out there, boy? Oof, a hobo took you back to his tent and had his way with you for just a ham sandwich. Oof, you didn't even get the ham sandwich? <laughs> Uh, oh, that is super sad. But Funky P-Dog does indeed come running home to his master Mori, doesn't he? Funky P's beard had overtaken his face to the point where facial recognition software didn't even clock him as human. <laughs> Mori tried taking him to the barber shop, but Funky had a full-blown panic attack at the thought of even trimming his behemoth of a beard. At a loss for what to do, Mori sat down, put on his buddy cult leader persona, and asked Funky to describe the happiest time of his life. Funky grunted, but Mori was persistent in his compassion. At last, the beard began to speak. Well, this should be gold. <laughs> Funky said, hey, It was back in high school. I did flag core. And my two best friends were these lesbo chicks who would let me watch a bag. Yeah, we play D and D every weekend. <laughs> Maury thought for a moment. Well, I know plenty of lesbians. I'm sure some of them would be happy to give you a show, Funky. Nah, 
I met some girls under the bridge who let me watch them all the time. <laughs> Maury. Dodge Street. Funky, are you paying to watch these chicks go down on each other? Funky. No. Uh, we barter. <laughs> Maury. With what? Funky. Mind your business, perv. No, seriously, what physical possessions do you have aside from a can of beans wrapped up in a bandana and slung over your shoulders? And STDs, I guess. <laughs> uh, Maury acquiesces, saying, fine, fine, but do you miss tabletop, though? Funky. I guess. Maury. Have you ever played Shadowrun? It's so much cooler than D&D. &D. Funky. How? Maury, well, it's basically D&D &D for intellectuals. It's a cyberpunk, Funky. It, it's for intellectuals? Awesome. Let's play that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main selling point for you, is it? Maury, splendid. I'll call up this guy I met when I was trying to get into MMA. <laughs> you scrounge up a buddy and we'll do a trial run. Funky, Why'd you quit MMA? That sounds kick-ass. Maury, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> Being a lover definitely hurts a lot less. <laughs> According to Sage, Maury got banned from amateur MMA on his first day of training because he kept getting wood and making the other fighters uncomfortable. <laughs> Come on, use that to your advantage! <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive by the champion to <laughs> recognize. I mean, honestly, it was zero. Uh, but he was apparently otherwise polite and fun to talk to about nerdy stuff. Maury and Sage had kept in contact because they were both fans of Tabletop, and their enduring correspondence was about to pay off, uh, depending on how you look at things. Yes, yeah, Sage invites an old friend into his home and gets his house destroyed. Maury gets to put his genitalia on a wide variety of people. I think I know who's winning in this situation, but <laughs> I don't know. It ain't, it ain't my house. You fuck up your whole life in exactly the way you want. Go off. <laughs> Part two, durian, cumin, and infected toe jam. Again, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> Funky had been given the daunting task of finding a buddy to join the team. Though it's impossible to know what Funky had really been doing in his spare time, it seems like a fair assumption that he was hanging out under that bridge quite a little bit. I met some of his bridge buddies in the early stages of our relationship when he was trying to present himself as a good Samaritan who unironically befriended vagabonds. <laughs> Brought gourmet dishes from his work for the dining pleasure of the residents of the Dodge Street encampment and delivered inspirational secular sermons to his drinking buddies once the sacramental booze had been distributed. Did you buy any of that initially? I mean, I'll go to war defending homeless people. That's not even really that hard of a take. But I want to be very specific that I don't befriend vagabonds on purpose. <laughs> I had a friend who became a vagabond. Any additional vagabonds get the standard treatment of kind indifference. <laughs> anyway, pretty sus. He he's putting on a whole show for OP here. And she will expound upon it in her own words, saying, In my limited experience, these secular sermons were just funky slurring about whatever was grinding his gears in the moment. You know what really grinds my gears? You, America. You. While his drunk bridge buddies grunted and passed gas or puked in what Funky saw as approval. <laughs> They're not even paying attention, dude. <laughs> In reality, it was neither noteworthy nor particularly rousing, and though Funky fancied himself the Christ figure of the Dodge Street encampment, the bridge buddies that were coherent enough to carry on a conversation with me just seemed to find him annoying. <laughs> but they put up with him because he brought food and paid the hookers well. Oh! They probably shouldn't have said that to me. <laughs> Maybe he's purposely trying to blow up Funky's spot. Maybe save you a bit of heartache. Maybe swoop in there himself. But either way, that would have been it for me. <laughs> I'm not participating in that. 
OP says the most coherent of the bridge buddies did attempt to do some damage control and I was still naive enough to buy it. Dude, bro, what the fuck? <laughs> How do you convince yourself of that? You got told right to your face! I guess we are learning some hard lessons out here today. <laughs> Returning to the essential matter of finding a chummer to join the team, seeing as the bridge buddies didn't have reliable transportation, and many of them uh, worked on Friday nights, either selling drugs or miscellaneous services, Funky took to his other favorite haunt, Beer Goggles, the vilest nightclub in all of Wellsprings, and, well, a veritable spawn point for neckbeards. How many women do you think are in that club? They pay the entry fee and look in there and they're like, oh, fuck no. <laughs> uh, I'm leaving. Keep the money. Just let me the hell out of here. <laughs> Funky often sat with a gelatinous fat ass named Pongo, who apparently smelled like durian, cumin, and infected toe jam. So it's like poopy, smoky, infected toe jam. <laughs> and Pongo was indeed perpetually horned up. He was a virgin in his late 20s who spent every spare moment trying to think of ways to manipulate females into bedding him or blowing him or simply befriending him. And of course, he failed on all fronts. I mean, yeah, of course, take a fucking shower. <laughs> Uh, why is that so hard? Just, we, we start there and see how it goes, you know? Pongo idolized Funky, the same way Funky had once idolized Mori, simply because Funky could, sometimes, score. Yeah, I scored. Ha 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 ha, he touched her boobs, ha ha ha. Uh, while Maury's simple advice to Funky about approaching women without an obvious agenda had improved Funky's chances of getting dates, the same advice failed miserably when imparted to Pongo, mostly because Funky hadn't bothered to recommend, you know, a nice shower and some clean clothes and a slathering of deodorant before Pongo gutted up to the bar next to a ten. What an idiot. <laughs> Nevertheless, Funky proposed a trial shadow run session to his paunchy Padawan, and Pongo happily accepted. Meanwhile, Mori got in touch with Sage and told him that he was finally putting together a team. Sage mentioned that he had an MMA buddy who was in the tabletop, and Mori was delighted to make room for Snorlax on the crew. And so, the original lineup was Mori as the GM, Funky as the head street samurai and assistant GM, Sage as the mage, Snorlax as the adept, and Pongo as the other street samurai. <laughs> uh, sure, why not, dude? We'll just all roll as barbarians. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> Might actually be a pretty lit game. Everybody just starts screaming unintelligibly at each other over the, the gaming table. So yeah, while it's perfectly fine to have two characters of the same archetype on one team, but in Pongo's case, he really would just lazily choose to do whatever Funky was doing. Let that sink in. Pongo's substitute for a personality was emulating Funky. Pathetic. <laughs> do they still kick it? What happened when Funky moved away from Pongo? He just dissolved into a giant pile of goo. I don't know what I am anymore! <laughs> In preparation for the maiden voyage of this motley crew of shadow runners, Mori had insisted that Funky tidy up the beardiness in their townhouse. Funky did Mori's bidding, although it was a half-hearted effort to make that hardwood floor a little less sticky and remove the heaps of ultra-feminine toiletries from the bathroom, soon enough, Mori would buy his lanky little bro an ornate vanity where he could house his hoard of beauty products and comb the crabs from his beard. <laughs> Gross. It does seem a bit like Mori is just grooming Funky to become his little plaything. And then, as you might remember from the saga, Mori couldn't handle what he had created. <laughs> he ghosted him completely. 
because I'll say again, he's a person in dire need of psychiatric help. He's probably too proud to take it, seek it, accept it, whatever. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't need it. <laughs> okay, so now the townhouse was ready-ish. Funky was donning his favorite three-piece suit and had topped it off with his signature lime green cravat. What a fitting color. The color of toxic sludge. <laughs> Mori had devised a captivating mission, and his GM binder was already bursting with storylines. Extensive files on each megacorp, descriptions of every imaginable villain from the fictional dystopian future into which the team would venture, and the nography. <laughs> but some time would pass before all that pervy stuff came into play. Sometime like a couple hours, or like months. <laughs> Pongo arrived early, and was eager to get the dice rolling, wearing his own lime green scarf atop a stinky, sticky, stained Star Wars t-shirt. Oh, Pongo, you're so obvious, aren't you? <laughs> Why is his name Pongo, anyways? Isn't that from 101 Dalmatians? Like, the, the, the father dog is Pongo? <laughs> of course, dogs are... Pretty poor judge of human beauty. Uh, oh, probably because he's like Funky's dog or something? Anyway, Funky had boasted to Mori about having taken a clueless youngster under his wing, just as Mori had done for him when they first met. Mori was hopeful that Funky's new role as a mentor would propel him up to the next ring on the adulting ladder but those hopes were dashed as soon as Mori smelled Pongo. <laughs> Mori loved rolling around in filth here and there, but he didn't want extreme filth perpetually fouling the air in his home, which his mother paid for. <laughs> he and Funky got on well enough as housemates, since Funky's beard mess was usually nothing worse than party fouls and, well, oodles of beauty products. So he doesn't trim or shape his beard, but he puts a bunch of product into it? Or is that for the head hair? I'd also argue that it's a bit more than a party foul if you're spreading crabs around the place in which I live. <laughs> uh, then again, I don't know, you just shave your sack and you're like, problem solved. Easy day! Maury lit a candle and cracked a window just as Sage and Snorlax rocked up and those two immediately intimidated the hell out of the neckbeards. Snorlax was still in his wrestling prime and looked like a hulking mound of living, breathing whoop-ass. He already preferred Gigglebush to booze, but Snorlax would not become a total stoner until an injury got to him, and he decided to lean on reefer instead of pain pills. Honestly? Advisable. <laughs> Sage was a third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he was obviously shredded. It was always an absolute crowd pleaser at MMA tournaments when these two titans battled it out in the ring. I assume they would be in different weight classes. Although maybe that comes later down the road. <laughs> Instead of reveling in rivalry, Sage and Snorlax decided to keep the competition friendly, and they soon discovered that they shared a love of gaming. It was a truly wholesome bromance, but the beards just assumed that the tough guys were violent meatheads who were constantly looking for asses to kick. Funky and Pongo might have boasted about big alphas on their favorite internet forums, but yeah, they knew, they both knew deep down, that the two of them were a couple of weenies. <laughs> and a little weenie at that. It's always the people that bark about it the most, and then upon a little closer inspection, you're like, oh, I, I see why you feel the need to call yourself that. You can't possibly survive your existence without pumping up your ego every minute of the day. Anyway, <laughs> Mori cheerfully made introductions, but Funky remained relatively quiet and sulky. He was pitifully butthurt over the fact that Mori invited a pretty boy like Sage into their home, seeing that Mori was fully aware of the deep, indelible scars that modeling school had left on Funky's butt-ugly soul. Funky had trouble trusting non-ugly men, 
though he eventually decided to give Mori a pass because he viewed him as gay and therefore not competition. I mean, he's bi, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> I think Funky is like full incel. He, he doesn't like dudes that are more handsome than him. And he doesn't like basically any woman ever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all because of his own self-hatred and, and, yeah, he can't seem to remedy that part. Sure, you got laid a few times by probably women who also had some self-hatred within themselves. That's not winning. <laughs> let's, let's do some work and try and be better. Or not. I can't tell you how to live. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but Funky had instantly trusted Pongo during their sweet little meet-cute in the filthy unisex bathroom at Beer Goggles, they were both laughing at some jejune female bashing graffiti written in poop. <laughs> uh, Funky noticed Pongo's laughter, looked over, and immediately knew that Pongo was a good dude. Dude, he's probably the one that wrote the poop graffiti. <laughs> Didn't even wash his hand, just wipes it on his pants like, yeah. These are still good for another day. Oh, I'll flip them inside out. <laughs> uh, Funky found laughter immature and annoying, unless the person was laughing at something truly clever, like poop graffiti. <laughs> Plus, Pongo didn't look like a, a pretty boy D bag. What do you look like? A fruit pilled peach cell? Doubt it. Couldn't happen. Get on my level, bro. <laughs> So Funky joined in on this laughter, and the beards quickly bonded over the shared loathing of women with standards. <laughs> uh, there was a misandrist retort written in period blood underneath the poop graffiti, so Funky and Pongo both decided to pee on the bloody retort. Dude, bro, what? Hold on. What the fuck is in the water in this town? <laughs> Everybody just shows up to the, the dive bar to put their bodily fluids on the wall. Could we not? Could we return to a high trust society at any point? I guess not. We, we've gone too far. <laughs> we can't go back. Uh, uh, returning to the maiden's voyage of Funky's adventures in Shadowrun, Mori was going over the shockingly G-rated rules, and they were all very technical and confusing, and shadow runny, so I'm not gonna list them out. To this day, I basically just roll the dice and go with the flow. Sage is the only one who really knows what's going on. <laughs> I asked him for a coherent explanation of the game once, and it took several hours. I glazed over, but he did manage to explain Edge to me, although Red X's explanation was honestly way more entertaining. Yes, and fun. But it might also give you cancer of the prostate and also clown pocket parts. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby, you make me so horny. <sighs> That's not true. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the game kicked off and miraculously continued without any noteworthy incidents on the first night. Sage, Snorlax, and Mori were all extremely bothered by Pongo's Pong but no one kicked up any obvious fuss about it, yet. Sage and Snorlax both thought that Funky was a snob because he never laughed, he rarely spoke unless it was to Mori or Pongo, and he often glared resentfully at the muscular forearms that rolled their dice. I mean, put the work in, dude. <laughs> you could have muscular forearms too, you're just not willing to do what it takes to get there. Which is also fine, but yeah, then you have to be fine within yourself. Which he definitely isn't. Muscular arms is just the tip of the iceberg for this fucking guy. Uh, nobody fought, nobody yelled, and only one person got shit-faced and puked and passed out, and of course, that person was Funky. Pongo tried to match Funky drink for drink, but he remained conscious and kept his booze down. No one was sure if he just couldn't quite keep up with Funky's staggering alcohol consumption, or if his stratospheric BMI threw off the equation for how much alcohol was needed to induce vomiting. It's probably a combination of both. I'm so glad I don't feel the need to do this anymore in my old age. I have one beer and people are like, how about another one? I'm like, yeah, how about not? <laughs> I had the one, I think I'm good. 
I feel it a little bit. See you later. Maybe a bit of a party pooper, but I don't know. Alcoholism runs in my family for one, and for two, I don't want my kids to ever see me out of it like that, you know? We could get a little tipsy, yeah, whatever, four or five drinks over the course of a few hours, but always remain in control for the children. <laughs> At this point, OP does presume that the comments have something to say. Dang it, OP! We want to know how the games get gross! When does Maury start rolling around in the vom? Why is Maury's junk still in his pants? Where's all the crap buckets and pee jars? Why is Funky the only one getting blackout drunk? Well, I hear ya. I hear ya. But Pongo's presence plays a vital role in the degeneracy, so I had to take the time to introduce this additional beard. Nevertheless, I'll flash you guys forward a few months in the next part. Oh my god, it's... <laughs> okay, it all has to go at the end, and we'll just Tarantino around during the compilation. It's fine. But I am waiting with bated breath for the next part. This one was just posted today. You could tell I'm chomping at the bit, can't you? <laughs> Returning briefly to the current day aftermath of Shadowrun Mayhem, Molly was fortunately able to call in an experienced biohazard crew to clean up OP's gigantic, mammoth, dinosauric, super slippery dippery snail trail. <laughs> Sage's home would only be... <laughs> <laughs> would only be defiled once more during the following weekend's gaming session when Funky and Mori experienced a rather revolting felching fail in the guest room. Oh my god, dude, felching. Uh, you remember? Is anybody out there a felcher? <laughs> uh, if you don't know what it is, I'm just gonna say probably don't Google it. Maintain your purity, please. <laughs> Uh, uh. But once the deviant and the beard hit the skids, the rest of us were clean, courteous guests whenever we gathered for gaming. And thank goodness for that! On that delightful note, thank you so much for braving this origin story. So very much. I think I'll need about two more installments before the degeneracy gets into full swing. Like I said, I'm fully aware that it doesn't fully explain why the degeneracy came to be, but damn, it always cracks me up when the other chummers tell stories that paint Funky in an unflattering light, and I'm hoping it's entertaining to others as well. Yeah, he's definitely a character. <laughs> if you're here for just the disgustingness, well, hang tight. We're gonna get there! This section of backstory might have been tame, because the game night was still a sausage fest. It's gonna get awkward when Sage brings Athena around. Plus, Mori was keeping the weird stuff hidden because his cult leadery brain knew exactly when he'd be able to bust out his creepy crap and still keep the team together. Damn, it goes deeper than I ever could have imagined, honestly. <laughs> but I'm totally here for it. Two more parts? Fine. Load me up. We got plenty of time to fill to get that big old beefy 12-hour compilation. Even though YouTube doesn't seem to like those as much. <laughs> Generally, the three-hour compilations perform better. But uh, I'm just talking out loud. Really looking forward to the next part. I hope you sicken me to my core. And I'm sure that's what everybody else is hoping for, too. Don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe on this video if you did enjoy, friends. Go out there and tell the entire world that the word of the day is snail trail. Ah! You said the secret word. <laughs> and of course, always remember, friends, that you are loved, you are worthy, you definitely, definitely deserve it, and I shall see you in the next one. So until then, uh, bye bye. Go ahead, cut him open. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. Where is he? It's just a fact.